Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. But I was thinking this week when I was working on this message, I thought, you know, probably one of the one of the toughest things that a pastor has to preach on in in his year and there's different things that we feel like that every year we have to preach on that we we have to preach on um we have to preach on giving or tithing or money we have to preach on salvation we have to preach on the holy spirit we i mean we and we we do it in different ways to hopefully not bombard you with just one way but then the more i thought about it i thought a more difficult message is the message of today talking about missing persons because all of us at one time or another have encountered missing persons a missing person and and we've already kind of determined that a missing person is what a missing person is any person who is far away from God who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ a, a missing person is anybody who is far from God and a missing person can be the worst of the worst of the worst sinners or it can be just somebody that hasn't been in church and hasn't been around or somebody that, that is an acquaintance of you that you know that they need the Lord. Because let me tell you this, if they don't have Jesus and they're not living for Jesus, then they're not with him. You know, they're not with him. And you know, we've, we've learned this in this series that the very first command that Jesus ever gave, what was the very first command? Do you remember? It's two words. Oh, wow. Y'all are an intelligent bunch this morning, aren't you? You can read. The very first command that we, we know that Jesus gave was what? Follow me. He said, follow me because I want you to be a fisher of men. And we studied the first week how Peter, James, and John were out. And Jesus came to them and he said, hey, cast your nets out. They were like, what? We're not doing that. We fished all night long. We, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a carpenter. We don't want to hear you. They threw their nets out and they were amazed. And in the first part of that story, Peter had looked at Jesus and he called him Master. He said, Master, why are we doing this? Why are we doing all this stuff? But when, when they saw what Jesus did, then they looked at him at a total different light. And Peter looked at him and said, Lord, who are you? Who is this man? And later on, they were to say, who is this that the winds and the waves obey his will? Who is this that can speak peace to my life when there's an unbelievable storm raging? Who is this man that said, follow me follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men the, the catch that you've just seen on the side of the boat is nothing compared to what you're going to see to the harvest that's going to be made now a common term for fishing for people is evangelism and, and the truth is that the majority of us now listen to me the majority of us who claim to be followers of Christ evangelism and finding missing people and fishing for other people is probably one of the hardest things that we do it's one of the toughest things we do because it seems to get us out of our comfort zone it seems to get us to a place because some of some of us some of you at the workplace you are undercover brothers now on Sunday you'd be raising your hands be dancing around you'd be singing we believe you got your cigarette lighter out doing the whole thing but then on Monday through Friday you're an undercover brother you don't really want anybody to know that what you really have on the inside of you is very controversial to what the world says right now and it puts us in a tough place to where that we get to be frustrated maybe and I'll tell you, it may be some of the most frustrating things that you've ever done. I can't, I can't begin to tell you through the years of, of my ministry how tough it's been. People will say, you know, I, 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 I would like to talk to you about Jesus. Or you, you want to you hear about it? Yes. Do you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you understand that God raised him from the dead? Yes. He's alive right now? Yes. Do you understand that he wants to forgive you of all of your sins? Yes. Do you understand that, that the only way that you're going to have a meaningful and a worthwhile life is to accept Jesus Christ? Yes. So would you like to accept Jesus right now as the Lord and Savior of your life? No, not really. What? Right then, I want to commit felonies. I really do. I want to bash them over the head. 
I want to lay hands on them quickly. <laughs> and if you've been here the last couple of weeks and all this series has done is just made you feel guilty about where you are, then that's not what I'm trying to do. If, if, you, really, if you really don't have any hooks in the water and you're really not trying to fish for people I had a lady come uh, last Sunday I believe and she walked in and there was a whole family with her she goes these are my fish <laughs> and she was so thrilled that she had a whole family a, a mom and a dad and a couple little kids and a, and a daughter that were with them that she said these are my people but sometimes we just feel inadequate we feel like it's a hard thing for us to do to share our beliefs or to, to share our story or to share wh what we are, to share what Christ has done for us. It, it, we, because we feel like we're going to be bashed. But we feel like we're going to get to the end and we're sitting across the table from them and we've asked them all the right questions. We've done all the right things. And when we get to the part where we say, do you want to know Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life? They just go, no, not really. I'm good where I'm at. If you've ever felt like that or you, you, you feel like that, that you can never do this, this story is for you. Because I want to take the pressure off of you. Because Jesus took the pressure off of his folks. He took the pressure off when he gave them this. And this is in the, uh, the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. If you want to turn in your Bibles this morning, my text is going to basically come from there. Now, now Jesus taught in stories or parables. He tried to simplify things because it, it, the, the Bible says that Jesus came and he confounded the wise. And he did it in simple things. That, that made, made the most intelligent people just kind of get, get to the end of his story. And they went, huh? And then they would find a deeper and a deeper and a deeper and a deeper meaning. They would find that these earthly stories had an unbelievable heavenly meaning. Now, Jesus told, if you, if you go back and look at Jesus' ministry, he told about 40 parables. And it's, it's only one, of, this is only one of, of two parables that Jesus ever told that had a title. And it's, it's only one of three parables that Jesus ever did that he actually interprets. It's only one of three that are found in the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That this same story is in all three. In all three, the, the first of all par parables that Jesus told, it's not only the first parable, but it's a foundational parable. It's like the parable of all the parables. Because he's setting us up for what he's doing. Now, if you remember that Jesus' very first sermon... He talked about the kingdom of God. The first sermon that Jesus ever gave, he talked about the kingdom that was coming. He, he talked about the kingdom and the kingdom of God's word. Now this parable that we're going we're gonna to read this morning is about receiving. It's about receiving the word. And, and it's a simple story. It, it's a story about a farmer that goes out into his field and he, he has some seed and he drops his seed on different times of soil. And look at this. The quality of the soil determines whether or not the planting of the seed is successful and produces a harvest. The quality of the soil. Now, if you'll listen to what I just said, you'll recognize there's three major components in this story, that, or this parable that Jesus gave. There's three things. There's the sower. Everybody say the sower. sower. The seed. seed. Say it with me. And the soil. soil. Three major components. Let's look at these. The sower is the Christ follower. The sower is me and you. The disciple. It's whoever is being sent out. The sower. The seed is what? The seed is the word of God. The seed is the message of the kingdom. The, the seed is your story. The seed is what's Christ done in your life. And then number three, the soil is the heart of the missing person that we're trying to reach. So you've got the sower, the seed, and the soil. Everybody say it again. The sower, the seed, and the soil. The soil is the heart of the missing person that you're trying to reach. So let's read this parable. And this is Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Let's look at this. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood by the beach. And he told many of them these things in parables. He said this, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. So where were the first seeds planted at? Along the path. All right? Other seeds fell among the rocky ground where they didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they have no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. 
Now other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus said, him who have ears, let him hear. Look at the person beside of you and say, you've got nice ears. Tell them. That's it. Great ears. Isn't it weird that your ears never stop growing? Think about it. Your ears never stop growing. I used to look at my grandpa, and his ears had these long dangly things on them about that long. It's like, it's like messing with your grandma's. No, it won't go there. Here we go. Now, he who has ears, let him hear. The sower, the seed, and the soil. Now, remember what I said. I'm trying to take the pressure off of you. Jesus was trying to take the pressure off of his buddies and say, hey, boys, e -e easy. The, because the focus of, of, of the parable was not on the sower. The sower was not even identified. He just said it was some farmer. And it, it was not really on the seed. It didn't say what kind of seed. It didn't say it was grass seed, pumpkin seeds, corn seed, whatever. All it said was it, the seed was scattered. The only thing that was different in the parable are the soils. One was a path, one was rocky ground, one was thorny ground, and then one was fertile soil. So Jesus uses the bulk of his story to talk about the dirt. In, in, in the whole parable, the sower doesn't change, the seed doesn't change. The only, look at this, the only variable determining failure or, or, failure or success in this story is the soil. It's the soil. In other words, the one thing that determines success in evangelism is not the sower or the seed, but it's the soil. It's the soil. So remember back at the beginning, who is the sower? We are. What's the seed? The Word. And then who's the soil? It's the missing persons. It's the people that need Christ. Look, you'll notice there was nothing wrong with the sower, how he sows. It was not his method. There's nothing wrong with the seed. He didn't have bad seed. There was nothing wrong with the composition of the soil. Because dirt's basically dirt. The problem was in every one of those things, the condition of the soil. It was the condition of the soil. Some of it had been beat down because it was on the path. Some of it was in a place where there was rocks. And the ground was real thin. So it went in, it sprang up really quick, but it had no roots. And then some of it was on thorny ground, the Bible says, where it was just a wasteland. It was a place that it would never come up. But there was some scattered on fertile, fertile soil. So here's the key to my whole message this morning. And I can stop right here. Look at this. My key, mess, my key takeaway this morning, our part is to sow, God's part is to grow. Say that with me. Our part is to sow. God's part is to grow. Our part's to sow. Spread it out. Give it out. Throw it, out. throw it out there. We can do our part. Let me tell you this. We can do our part. We can do everything that we need to do. We can have all of our I's dotted and our T's crossed. But there's only one that can reach the heart, and his name is Jesus Christ. We can do all we can. We can have all, everything ready and prepared. We can have all of our tracks in line. We, because God, God won't do our job. God's not going to do our job of going to somebody and inviting them. That's our job. Our job is to sow. And we can't do his job. Remember we talked about cleaning fish? That is not our responsibility. Because when we clean fish, what do we do? We cut their heads off and gut them. When God cleans fish, he makes something beautiful out of them. There are always three Three different players in evangelism. You, the missing person, and God. There's three different players in evangelism. We need you. We need somebody to talk to. Then we need God to touch their heart. So let's good. Number one, our part is sowing the seed. Our part is sowing the seed. So, there, there, so there's no misunderstanding about the story. Let's read it one more time. In, in Matthew 13, 18, 19. Hear, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom. Matt, Matthew calls the seed that, that was being spread the word of the kingdom. Luke, Luke calls it, Luke says, the seed is the word of God. Let me tell you something. It, this seed is productive. 
It's something that when you plant it in, something, in somebody or something, it's a productive seed. The, the very purpose of seed is to do what? Produce fruit, produce grass, produce corn, produce whatever. So seed, seed, when it's the word of God, it's going to produce fruit. Do you, know how, do you know how a believer, how you produce a believer out of an unbeliever? By seed. It's by putting something inside of them that will change them, that will, will produce something beautiful. First Peter, First Peter um, 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring Word of God. So when we begin to plant, when we begin to sow, when we begin to scatter, we are scattering the imperishable, everlasting, alpha and omega Word of God. Somebody say amen. Yeah, listen, you, I want you to understand the importance of this. That The sower went out to sow, and what he was going out to sow was seed. And the seed is the Word. The seed is the Word. And it is imperishable. It's going to last and last forever. But here's the thing. The seed can't plant itself. The seed can't plant itself. If I have the Bible, and I've got it right there, it's going to do me no good. But it's when I pick it up and I feast on it and I put it inside of me and I begin to scatter that and it comes living outside, in, outside of me. That's when it becomes something that can be put into somebody else's life and can change an unbeliever to a believer. It takes a sower to sow seed. How many of you have ever farmed? Have you ever planted any seeds sitting in your living rooms, Sammy? No. You got to get out. You got to get on the tractor. You got to make an effort to walk out the door. You got to walk out there. You got to have something in your hand. You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. A seed cannot plant itself. A seed by itself is absolutely useless. This word is useless to somebody else unless we give it to them. A fisherman, he's no good without a hook and a rod and a reel or a net. He's not going to do anybody any good. Let me tell you something. Missing persons cannot be found if you're not looking for them. If you're not looking for them, they ain't going to be found. It's up to us. We are the sowers. You can't do it sitting in your living room. Once in a while, you have to open the curtains and look outside across the, across the way and across the fence and say, you know what? Old Charlie over there, he needs what I've got. Even though Charlie stole my lawnmower, he still needs what I got. <laughs> he needs what I have. And I need to sow some seed in Charlie's life. The farmer's got to go with seed. And the fisherman's got to go with the hook. That's why preaching and teaching of the word, Dad, has always got to be central in everything that we do. We have got to plant that seed inside of you so that you can have that reproductive seed to spread out wherever you are. No, don't, don't miss this. What mattered is it's not how the sower scattered the seed. It's not his method. It's not that he had the hook shot going on with the seed or he had the jump shot. Or he was throwing it one by one by one. It was that he did it. It was that he had an opportunity to go out. Look, sowing seed, it's a pretty low-tech thing. It don't take a rocket scientist to sow seed. But you can't do it sitting on your blessed assurance. You got to get up. And you got to sow some seed. The sower would just carry out whatever he had. The Bible says, it talks about him taking his garment up and filling his garment up and just taking it out of his hand and just sowing. Some may hit rocky ground. Some may hit thorny ground. But you've got to sow it. If you're not going to sow it, it's never coming up. Remember what we're talking about. The sower, the seed, and what else? The soil. But our job is to sow. It doesn't take great skill or great training or great education to say, hey man, I know what you're going through and I've been there before too. But I'm telling you, greater is he that's within me than he's with, he that's within the world. And I just want to tell you just a little bit of my story. And what happens? Your story becomes seed that can go into somebody's life. And in a minute you'll see their eyes begin to well up with tears. Why? Because you're scattering seed. You're scattering seed. It doesn't matter how you scatter it. It just matters that it's scattered. Look, it's not the expertise of the sower, but it's the quality of the soil that determines the harvest. That takes the pressure off of you. 
You just got to sow it. Our part is to go and sow. Our part is sowing the seed, throwing it out. Number two, the other's part. The other people, their part is receiving. Their part's receiving the message. Remember, the focus of the parable is not on the sower and not on the seed. It's on the soil. Listen, even the very best farmer with unbelievable seed can have a bad harvest if his soil's bad. If he doesn't have the right elements in the soil. If the soil isn't, isn't receptive to the seed. Again, that takes the pressure off. Jesus identifies the soil, look at this, as the heart of the missing people in the 19th verse of chapter 13. Look, it says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Along the path. Now remember, there was four different kinds of soil. Four different kinds of soil. It was the path where people had walked on and trampled it down. It was hard as a brick. Then there was places to where there was rocks. And there was thin soil so it wouldn't come up much. And it was thorny places. Then the fertile place. Now in, in Palestine, people would walk along the same way. That's what Jesus was talking about. They would walk along the same way. And how many of you have a path out to your outhouse behind your house? You have a path? Okay. Some, some of you are going, what? But you had a path, a place that you walked every day. And if you walk that path, whether it be out to your deer stand or wherever it is, it's going to mash down. It's going to press down. And it's going to be a place that we're hard. And then the seed won't be able to get into the ground. Why? Because the soil's hard. It'd be like just water running off of a duck's back or just a rubber bouncy ball on concrete. It was, it'd be like people that were just disinterested and hostile to the word. See, we're talking about sowing seed wherever we can sow it and understand that it's not our job to determine what the harvest is. It's his because it's a matter of the soil. So if they're disinterested and they're not ready to listen to you, it's not your fault. Your job is to keep sowing, to keep throwing it out because there's going to be somebody that is receptive and ready. Matthew 13, 20 through 21 says, As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, and he endures for a while, and then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And that's the second type of seed that he talks about against the rocks. Thin, receptive to begin with, but then when trials and persecution come, the roots are gone, and they have nothing. Those of you who've been to Israel, you've seen before, it's just a rocky place. It's, it's a hard place. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. People that, that are ready to receive and then all of a sudden they're just. Whose responsibility is it? Is it yours at the, as a sower? No. Is it the seed's responsibility? No. It's the one that's receiving the message. We're looking for the right soil. It's like the people that come to me. Oh, pastor, that was just a great message. Oh, Lord, that was just the best message. And what they're really thinking is, it's not going to change me. It's not going to affect me. I'm really not going to do anything about it. But boy, that was a good message. And a lot of times people like that are coming to Jesus for the wrong reason. They're just coming so they can be seen with somebody else that's sitting down the row from them. They thought that they were joining God's army to be a five-star general. And the first time they hear a bullet go by their head, they check out. We have people all the time to check off the cards behind your seats or in front of your seats this morning. And we email them, we contact them, we never hear from them. And if you ever mention getting them baptized, they are allergic to water, just like that. <clears throat> they don't want anything to do with you. Another heart Jesus talked about was in 1322 of Matthew. Look. He said, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world, look at this now. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Let me say that again. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and it proves unfruitful. Now who are these folks? Now the first soil was seed that couldn't get down into the ground. The second was where the seed, the, seed, the first one was the seed couldn't get it. it, it, it could, they couldn't get it because it's bounced off. The second one, it didn't get down deep enough to make any difference. And this one, the seed just can't get out. 
the word is just choked out by financial prosperity, worldly possessions. Now look at this. These are people that say they want to follow the Lord, but the golf course and the lake house and the extra money and the bigger paycheck and the corporate ladder keeps getting in the way. Well, it gets quiet, don't it? Or it's the other way. It keeps getting in the way of the people who just don't have those things, but they want those things. And those things, those financial things, are way more important to them than following Jesus. Because remember, when Jesus called the disciples, when he called Levi, Matthew, last week, he said, take all that you've got, lay it down, and follow me. Leaving everything that you have behind, and follow me. So what's the use of sowing a seed at all? So what's the use? Listen to the last heart. Look at this. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, and in one case, 160, 30 fold. He put another parable before him saying this. Look at this. He said, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to the man who sowed good seed in his field. This is the one that understands. This is the one that's receptive. This is the one that believes. This is the one that is, re is ready and, and ready to reproduce what they've heard. This is what keeps bringing the farmer back to the field. This is what keeps the fishermen to come back to the fishing, fishing hole again. If I went over to Harold Von Cannon's and fished and I didn't catch nothing two or three times, I wouldn't go back. But if I knew he was up underneath that water with that mask on and he was hooking me every time I went through my thing, I would go back. It's what keeps us going back. It's that person, Walt, that we come to and they're receptive and they say, yes, and we see them here. We see them over and over and over. We see their lives changed. That's what, that's what brings us to the place. See, missing persons, th these are the missing persons that want to be found. They're the ones that say, yes. To the kingdom. And that brings us to the third part. God's part is producing the harvest. God's part is producing the harvest. All a farmer can do is sow the seed. And all a fisherman can do is bait the hook. And be ready for what's around him. Our job is to sow. Remember this? Our job is to sow. And God's job is to what? Oh, come on. Our part is this on your paper. You can look. It's like number one or two. Our job is to sow. And God's part is to what? Grow. Grow. It's, that, takes our that takes the responsibility off of us. That, that takes it to where me and Earl and Les and Brett, we can walk arm in arm. And no matter where we are in Christ, no matter how smart Earl is and how dumb I am, it takes the pressure off because all we're doing is scattering seed and waiting to see where that seed is going to spring up. And the more seed you scatter, the more plants you're going to have. Think of your odds. Amen. Think of the odds. How many of you have ever been to Las Vegas and gambled? Do not raise your hand. <laughs> that is not one of those times you need to raise your hand. <laughs> no, amen. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Amen. <laughs> we went to Las Vegas a few weeks ago. Teresa and I did. We were there for a couple of days with some friends of ours. And um, we, we, I mean, anywhere you go in Las Vegas, you have to walk through a casino, walk back and forth. So everywhere we were, you know, I'm like. <laughs> so finally, we were, we were getting ready to board our flight at the airport. And they have uh, the one-armed bandits in the airport. So I'm like, okay, I'm giving it a shot. And they're calling for my flight, and I was up $10. I, I, put a, I, I spent $20. I put a $20, and I was up $10. And I was like, come on, Lord, the barn, the barn, the barn, the barn. And then I lost my $10 and had to come home. So, oh, well, so well. But if any of you do go to Las Vegas, we're believing, Lord, that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. But it's a numbers game. It's how long are you going to scatter the seed? If you ask one person this year to come to church with you and they turn you down, you're 0 for 1. But if you ask that same person and there's 99 behind them that you ask, then you got 99 out of 100. And the, the pressure is off. Because it's not you scattering the seed. 
and then dragging them around. It's you scattering the seed and watch that seed be reproduced by the power of the Holy Spirit in them. But if you never sow the seed, you're going to always be 0 for 1. And believe me, when you're hitting, when you're a, a if you bat 350, where's Jeff here this morning? If you bat 350 in baseball, Major League Baseball, where are you probably going to end up? 350 or better? The Hall of Fame. 350. That's 350 out of 1,000. That's 3 out of 10. If you get 3 people out of the 10 people, you're going to the Hall of Fame. Y'all think, y'all looking at me like I'm stupid. But I'm telling you, it's all scattering. It's sowing. Because let me tell you what, it's never going to happen unless you sow the seed. You're O for your life. When you walk up to the pearly gates and Jesus is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you for being O for one. You're in. You have fire insurance. You're going to make it. But nobody came along with you. You're O for one. Our job is to sow. God's job is to grow. The, the key, look at this. The key to reaching missing person is, is not the presentation of the message. It's not the presentation of the message. It's the penetration of the heart that the Holy Spirit's going to do. It's our job just to throw it out. Can you tell I'm just a little passionate about this? The presentation is our part. The penetration is God's part. The presentation, what we do, our story, asking somebody, Mike. Just asking somebody. Let me give, let me give it to you in an equation. You can write this. I think I put this in your paper. Faithful sharers plus fertile soil equals fruitful success. Say that with me. Faithful sharers plus fertile soil equals fruitful success fruitful success it's our job just to cast it out there because let me promise you this if you don't sow there will never be a harvest why are we not full this morning why are we not packed to the gills it's not because our music isn't good right it's not because the preaching isn't decent because the preaching is decent because I'm preaching the word. You might not like my delivery, but I'm giving you what this says. So you can, you can grade me on a scale of one to whatever that you want to, but I'm giving you the word this morning. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to do something. Today's the what? 19th day. Is that right? 19th day of October. Give yourself a year. Give yourself till fall festival time next year. And in this next year, determine in yourself that you are going to ask three people. Three. Three. Some of you will not even be overachievers. <laughs> so don't think I'm asking you to do something that's way out there. Three. Think what our congregation would be if we were three times what we are today. You think, oh, pastor, you just want to fill this place up. Yes, I do. Amen. I absolutely do. I want to fill it up to where we have, the ones that have been here for a long time, stand on Sunday morning around the walls and let people that come in that are these missing people have a seat. They take my seat. I've, I've been in here sitting on my blessed assurance long enough. Three people in the next year. Three people. Another thing you need to know. They're going to be, when Jesus talked about this, you can have people that are the thorny ground, the rocky ground, or the path that maybe sometime later when you come back to them, they're going to flip-flop to the fertile ground. The timing just may not be right. And it may be that at this point, right where they are right now in their life, they can't hear what you have to say. But it doesn't mean that you forget about them and strike them off your list. It means that you come back again and go, 
take a little bit of this because the last time I was around and told you about this I know you're in a tough place I know you're in a hard place because what may have seemed hard as a rock at one time now may be soft as a pillow and receptive to everything that you say because the timing in their life just isn't right you know the Bible says this it's appointed unto man wants to what? wants to die I want to tell you a story this morning it's a story and this, this is have I, gone in, have I skipped anything on your thing? on your papers? you can write your name at the bottom if you want to keep them out this is a true story of a guy that died several years ago his name was Pacey Cohen and some of you may have heard this story and it may not mean anything I, it is, and it doesn't really matter what city he was lived in or what he really did but I just want to tell you the story years ago it was uh, there were churches all over the place that would bring in um, celebrities to, uh, to speak and they would try to get big crowds and they would do it at like high school auditorium or high school football stadiums or whatever but this particular year this one church had invited uh, Terry Bradshaw you guys know who Terry Bradshaw is he was a quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers who won I don't know how many Super Bowls but four four Super Bowls Pacey Cohen had determined in himself this night that he was going to commit suicide he had determined that he was going to kill himself this night and for some reason he was driving his car and he went a different way that he normally wouldn't drive to drive home and when he did he drove by the football stadium and he had no idea that there was anything going on there but he saw on the marquee a sign that said here Terry Bradshaw quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers and it just so happens that Pacey Cohen was a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan and he thought to himself you know what since I'm gonna kill myself tonight I might as well give myself one last thrill I'm gonna go here I'm gonna, my hero talk just one time so Terry Bradshaw got up gave his testimony and Pacey was sitting way up in the bleachers about 3,000 people there Bradshaw gave his testimony oh, let me give you a quick Terry Bradshaw story years ago we did a Gaither video Terry Bradshaw was there he got up and sang and uh, I, I, was sitting, I was sitting up in the, in the crowd and so when Bradshaw got ready to walk off stage he had a football and I said, I said Bradshaw throw it so he threw it and hit me right in the hands and then he held his hands up so I threw it, I threw it right back to him hit him right in the hands so I didn't think anything about it. He walked by me a minute ago and he said, hey. I said, yeah. He said, you the guy that threw it to me? I said, yeah. He said, you got a pretty good arm. I said, thanks. He said, I'm really glad because I didn't have my glasses on. I never saw it coming. <laughs> so <laughs> here's my Terry Bradshaw story. But this particular night, Bradshaw, he was spoke. And when he finished, he went, they took him off the stage and he went to get on a plane to take him back to Louisiana where he was, where he was from. And there was no reason to really keep Pacey up in the stands but for some reason he stayed you see Pacey was also Jewish and he had never heard the gospel in his life he'd never ever been to a church in his whole life and when Terry Bradshaw finished the pastor got up behind him and kind of tied everything together that Terry Bradshaw had said and gave a simple message and an invitation it was about 3,000 4,000 people there that night and Pacey was sitting up on the top and he began to watch as people came down to the invitation that the pastor had given when the pastor was almost finished giving, giving his invitation he said this he said there's someone here tonight and tonight's going to be your last night on the earth and if you don't come and give your heart to Jesus Christ you ain't going to be alive tomorrow and you're going to spend eternity separated from God now if, if you had met Pacey after that night he said he would swear in a court of law that the preacher was staring at him when he said those words because he knew his circumstances he knew that it was 100% by chance that he was going to kill himself that night and he saw a sign that said Terry Bradshaw the choir started singing and people started coming down but after the pastor said that nobody moved and Pacey was sitting up there by himself so he got up he walked down and that night he received Jesus as the Lord of his life the next Sunday he went to the church where the pastor was out and he was baptized here's another thing Pacey became a full time evangelist and spent the rest of his life telling people his story about how Christ saved him how that, 
how hard that he was, but how through his hero, a football player, and happenstance, he pulls into a high school and accepts Christ. He came to the crusade ready to kill himself. Dry, rocky ground where maybe somebody had scattered seed before. But for some reason, that night, he was receptive. And somebody scattered the seed that produced an unbelievable harvest in this man's life who led hundreds and thousands of people to the Lord through his testimony. Pacey died. He died years later of lung cancer. And he had gotten to the point where he couldn't even breathe 60 seconds without oxygen. And his wife said that the day he died with his last words that he ever said on this earth, he laid on his deathbed and led his nurse to Christ. He was still scattered in seed. He was still scattering seed. You see, folks, our job is to sow, to throw it out, and God's job is to grow and have the people that are in front of us right at the right place at the right time. Because I can promise you this morning, if you will do your part, if you will do your part to scatter seed among the missing persons that we see every single day, God will do his part. So will you stand with me this morning? Thank you, Lord. Three people. Three people. If you get one for three, you're in the Hall of Fame. 333. Three people. I think I can't do that, Pastor. That's just not in my nature. There was a guy who used to sing a song here that said, you may be the only Jesus that somebody will ever see. Don't have to do it with great words. Because see, the pressure's off. The pressure's not in the presentation. The pressure's not even in the seed, which is the word, because we know that's going to be reproductive. The only thing we do is throw it out. And expect that ground to be fertile and ready and receptive. But if you don't throw the seed, it will never come forth. Because it will have no way. You have to wonder. How many people that you come in contact with through your life? From the beginning of your life to the end. Daddy always talks at funerals about the dash in the middle. Whatever the number before it is and whatever the number at the end, I don't really mean a hill of beans. But the dash in the middle, that's what we got to work with. But how many people have you walked past and not scattered any seed to that will never have an opportunity except Christ? That you were the one. You were the one. You were the one sent to scatter seed. And again, I'm not making, trying to make you feel guilty because the same has happened to me in my life. People that I look back on and say, man, I really should have talked to him or talked to them. Or I really should have shared Christ at that moment. They, they were receptive. The pressure's off. I'm asking you to bow your heads this morning. Lord, for all of us that are here today, that over the past few weeks or even if today is the first time being here for this series, Lord, we've heard the word. And we've heard how you used a simple statement of follow me, follow me, follow me. And that how, Lord, that you even went to people that were unlovable, that you went to the worst of the worst at that day, which was the tax collector. You went to Levi and you brought him in and you said, follow me and you turned him around. And now there's a book of the Bible named after him, Matthew. So, Lord, we know that if we take that commission of go and to follow me, that we're doing what, we're, we're following your commandment. So today, Lord, we're just going to take it a step farther. And I ask you, Lord, to give every one of us in here a measure of boldness that we've never had before. 
that everyone in here would determine in themselves to reach somebody for Christ. To reach somebody. But Father, I pause right now because if there are things in our life that are holding us back and things that we are ashamed of, if there's reasons in our life that we cannot minister to somebody else, I ask you, Lord, right now, that you come and make a new change. That, Lord, you clean us up. And that we don't hide behind our inadequacies or the sin that's in our life. But we get all of that stuff out of the open. So, Father, I pray, if there's anyone in here today that says, Pastor, the real reason that I can't minister to somebody else is because I'm not right myself. If there's anybody here this morning, I just want you to raise up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need help where I'm at. I can't do it for anybody else because I got to do it for myself first. Amen. I see your hand this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For people that are honest and say, I got to get past myself before I can, ask, before I can help anybody else. Father, I thank, the, thank you that you have come to save and forgive every person that feels inadequate this morning or feels like they've just done so many things they just can't get around it. So Father, I ask you to come and forgive them, to raise them up, to clean them up, Lord, that they can have the boldness of telling their story. And they won't do it ashamed, but they'll do it gladly. Jesus, I thank you so much that you've taken the pressure off of us that you've given us a way, that you've given us a design, that you've given us a scheme that we can follow. And it's, it's a fail-safe. So we come and we thank you now, Lord, for blessing us, for helping us, for leading us, for guiding us, for directing us. And I ask you, Lord, that you give every person in this place fertile soil, fertile soil in the name of Jesus. Father, let us go out from this place today and sow seed like we've never sown before. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Lord bless you.